particular, uh, how would you define architecture? Uh, again, uh, I've been defining it quite similarly for very long. I mean, there's a basic core value there. So a lot of people have probably heard me lecture or read something or connected up with it. But I really think that architecture is both, like I say, pragmatism and poetry, but it's about this idea of functionality and beauty. Mm -hmm. It's about this idea of reinvention. Uh, to be an architect, you have to be an exceptionally good listener and you have to sort of dig down and just not take it as a simple list of areas and relationships and things. Uh, architecture is of a place and it wants to feel of its place and its time. And while we, architecture, when you look at the great things that sort of in time, the things we study, the things we go and look at, the things we hold as our ideals, you know, everything old was new once, mm. okay? And that's an important thing to read, okay, remember. Mm -hmm. Because we learn from the past to build the future. It's about the passion that we bring to a place. I think that I'm optimistic right now that our cities are becoming more walkable, more about people, and about certain density. We still have this sad divide between the rural and the community and the city, mm -hmm. uh, both in this country and the world. But there's something that architecture is about what make, buildings make the fabric of a city, as well as the texture and the circulation and the scale and the climate and the landscape, all those things are part of what makes each place unique and an architect has to respect all those things and I've at this point had the privilege, well, people think of me as a desert guy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at my portfolio, you see that there's a house on the East Coast that I've been working on for 25 years, mm -hmm. same client, ongoing through evolution. It's a rather dramatic and exotic house <laughs> on the, the Pacific Ocean, I see the Atlantic Ocean and it was interesting because uh, the man who commissioned that house had a fondness for Frank Lloyd Wright. He has resources of uh, family, industrial family, that gave him the resources to sort of live his dream at one level. He always wanted to be an architect, but his parents wouldn't let him, so he got into sort of business management at a, a regulator firm, a regulator, and Fred is an amazing guy, and he uh, got this piece of land, and he called me cold. And he said, you know, I, I have this fondness for Frank Lloyd Wright. At that time, I had not realized that he had seen pictures and drawings, but never been in a building. Mm -hmm. But he had a fondness for Wright, and everybody that he was talking about, it was, uh, he called me uh, for the first time. We just had our 25th anniversary, so it was in uh, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, early 90s. It was, yeah, it was about 94, 95 and uh, said that if I'm interested in Wright, I should be talking to you. So I flew out and met with him. And he was interviewing somebody from a couple other firms. He'd actually been working with somebody else of consequence, so his name you would know instantly, but I'm not gonna put it out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I went and met with him. He flew me out there, and I met him uh, at a train station. Uh, turns out uh, about a block between the train station and the ocean, which I didn't know was there because I just got off the train. Uh -huh. And we got in this portion, we drove down the driveway, and he showed me his site, and then we looked at another site, and uh, the next thing I had uh, programmed the house with him and his, his partner at the time, and uh, we went on this journey, and it's called Sea Ark, mm -hmm. and he's been a patron now for, for uh, 25 plus years. I wow. talked to him three days ago, okay? Yeah. So we go from the East Coast to the West Coast, and there is work that's in... Uh, San Francisco Bay, and there's work in Reno, Nevada, and there's work in Wyoming, and there's work in Colorado, and every time I go there, it's about discovering that place, and I'm not interested in bringing an architecture, my architecture, any place. I'm interested mm -hmm. in bringing my ability to be curious and listen and to create an architecture of those places, mm -hmm. you know. And coming from a Midwestern background, you know, I know what cold is, but an architect's challenge is to be able to work anywhere and be respectful, and it's not just bringing a style. Uh, some people, the style is uh, 
is white and geometric, is modernist, right? And uh, I believe that contemporary modern architecture can be warm and organic and human. Mm -hmm. And I think that hopefully that's what you feel when you go to Central Library. Yeah. I mean, it's a different sort of modern building. Yeah. It's a, a building for the ages, but by its whole, every being, it's of this place, it's not only metaphorically of this base place as a mesa from Monument Valley in copper, in the copper state, even though the way it turned out, the copper probably came from Eastern Europe or South America because mm -hmm. they, we couldn't get a, a wide coil to take care of the, take advantage of the industrial uh, manufacturing we needed for that metal to be formed, which was normally a technique used for grain elevators, which are made of steel. Mm -hmm. But the skin on the Central Library cost about $13.81 a square foot on a day when copper costs about $1.20 a square foot yeah. because of using grain elevator technology. Mm. A grain elevator that I looked at closely, not in the Midwest, but when I came to Arizona, behind the Hayden Flour Mill, which are the typical concrete towers down there in Tempe, mm -hmm. at the time they've been since taken down, they had built two bale grain elevators. And I wanted to use a curved abstraction and create this sort of form that almost feels like geology rather than architecture. Yeah and yet it's totally transparent on the ends. Mm -hmm. And by knowing that they could t turn metal into curved forms easily in Nebraska, we sent them some copper sheets. We did the sampling mm -hmm. and it became the skin of this building, you know, and it becomes this distinctive thing and the yeah. quality of the nature of its, how it sits on the, how it comes from the ground and kisses the sky. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a case in point, but that was job. So just as a point of perspective, Phoenix Central Library is job number 317. Wow. Okay, and that was, what, 20-some years ago now? Wow. Maybe 25 years old this uh -huh. uh, coming month. So that's, that's so cool. it's a journey. It's a yeah. journey, right? And there's lots of patios, and there's remodels, and this, that, and the next thing. And uh, like I say, we're now on job number 600 or 700. But and, and I'm old enough. I'm turning uh, 73 this year. Mm. And so hopefully there's a few years left. And yeah. uh, But um, it just uh, it's the way things go. So but uh, sort of a general thing that you probably can make some sense out of, mm -hmm. but you know, architecture really is about, uh, it's a background, it's an arbit armature for living, and it's there as something to enhance your life rather than command your life. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because a number of years ago, I uh, was lecturing in Michigan, and the dean of the school, there was a Frank Lloyd Wright house, the owner had passed, Red Square House, a really beautiful triangular house by Frank Lloyd Wright, and uh, that became my, my my hotel room for two nights. Mm. Okay, and it was ironic because I was about to give a lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright at the Phoenix Art Museum when I got back, mm. and I woke up there and I'd been to other Wright houses and I'd uh, you know been places. Okay, yeah. and yet being there by myself, you know, coming in, it was a, a winter's night. And I woke up, and it was this very complicated brick, typical Wrightian brick, and um, I think it was probably a Cypress house. It was impeccable. I'd been there with the original owners before they died a couple times. I visited the house, right? And here I am waking up in the master bedroom in a hexagonal bed, right? Yeah. And yet, was was, was really an interesting impression, is as heavily influenced by Wright as I am, and as respectful of, of Wright as I am. Uh, you know, Wright can talk, he had his love for Japanese art, but he was not a lover of modern art in any way, mm -hmm. shape, or form. And he felt that his houses, once you had a Frank Lloyd Wright house, it was everything. You didn't mm -hmm. need any of that other stuff. Yeah. You know, maybe a Japanese print, maybe this or that, a nice arrangement of flowers, uh -huh. my furniture, but nobody else's furniture, right? Yeah. I mean, Frank's furniture, exactly. right? Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I woke up very early because I wake up early anyways, and I'm I'm alone in this house, right? And it's like, oh my God, you know, and you're doing this, that, and the next thing. Mm. And uh, I realized that his houses were not, they were very much about him and his belief mm. in ideas and whatever. Uh, the Usonian became almost, a, 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 I don't want to say a cookie cutter because they were very, uh, they were good strategies. Mm. I've been in houses with clients of Frank Lloyd Wright, and Wright had never been to the site. He had never seen the finished product, and I'm sitting in these houses hearing their stories, right? Wow. That's very interesting. But waking up by myself in that environment, really thinking about right based on a lecture I'd been given a couple of days, right? Uh, that, you know, I felt a prisoner. I really, you know, be, and so my belief is that architecture should create well-proportioned, well-refined, 
materially responsive, elegant forms that are of their place that become your opportunity to create who you are and find who you are. Yeah. You know, not be controlled by this framework. And so, you know, and whether it's a functional building like a museum or a library, uh, you know, they are buildings that meet this test of time because they're totally flexible because as you've seen in your young life already and I've seen in my slightly longer life, you know, change is an, is an operative, but certain things don't change. And this whole awareness of proportion and scale and context and integrity of materials and, you know, people use the, the excuse often that, you know, you can't, you know, you don't get good architecture anymore because nobody can afford it. There aren't craftsmen to do it. Mm. There are craftsmen. There are still craftsmen. Yeah. But you have to have the ability as an architect to have a dialogue and listen you know, it's not just because I drew it, you're going to build it. Mm. It's like, well, how would you do that if you question, you know, and again, there's this dialogue. I mean, uh, gosh, it's only been a week ago. Time just moves along. Mm -hmm. About a week and a half ago, I did uh, a mock-up of uh, this tile ceramic quilt that's going to be the new skin of the additions at the Nevada Museum of Art. Really? And it was interesting because somehow we're working. We have our whole, I mean, 20-plus years we have a new museum director, but Amy Opio, the CEO of whose project it is at the museum, uh, was with at the beginning in 1999. Uh, the only person that's not there is the original landscape, which was peripheral at the time, and now I've got somebody that really is totally, but everybody else, the gentleman that sits at this desk here was sitting, uh, is sitting with me in Portland right now as we go through this phase of the project, worked on the original project, even though he went to Chicago uh, after that and did other things. Yeah. So it's really a, a unique experience, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, I have this idea of ordinary Endicott, black, it's a black building, inspired by the Black Rock Desert when you look on the website for the Nevada Museum of Art, and the new skin will be black, and it'll be, it'll be ceramic, it won't be metal, mm -hmm. it won't be black drive it, it'll be this whole new thing, and it's got a much simpler geometry at one level on the exterior, it's not as dynamically curvilinear and sculptural, mm -hmm. but I've got this idea of these ceramics. So the Endicott people sent me different sizes and shapes, of, well, they're all rectangles of different formats, but I'm using backwards and forwards and back and forth. When we're done, I'll show you a picture on my, my phone of it that you can see this, the sample that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And anyways, so I, I told the contractor, original contractor, built the first building for us, did the other things that we've done over the years, so that's ideal. Um, new younger players there, and somehow the new estimator just had this feeling, and he knew of this guy that was a master mason and tile setter. Mm -hmm. And so I met Paul, who is typical, sort of of the old tradition, he's not quite as old as I am, but he, you could just tell. And what happened was, and here, here we are, while well, you're sitting here today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I work on my device a lot, okay? Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, I, I send emails, I don't write letters, yeah. I'm not, I don't have that passion or that interest particularly. <laughs> and so anyways, when I was describing what I wanted to do for my mock-up, and I knew this day was coming, I'd heard about this guy, Paul. I didn't know his name was Paul even at that point. It's from Eastern Masonry. Mm. And Eastern because his feeling is that all the great Masons in America came from the Northeast. Okay, so I think it's called, the company name is Northeast Masonry in Nevada. Where do you get this name, right? Well, he knew the Portuguese and the Italians and all the great masonry tradition of that part of the country. So he named his masonry company years ago off of that name. Mm -hmm. Totally cool. And so here's Paul, Anglo guy, uh, physical, good shape, and running the company, gets in and out, very big, successful company. And he basically is knows, knows they're being considered for this job, but he was too busy to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So he gets my little email with some pictures of some tile on it, taken on this table that I turned upside down sideways to describe just a quick sketch of material of these tiles, right? And then I wrote about 40 words, not a lot, right? It doesn't take a lot of words sometimes. Mm -hmm. And he said, you had me. He said, you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, this and the, that and the texture and why you're gonna do it, what's this whole thing about, and this quilt and all this stuff. And he said, a week and a half ago before I got your email, I was going to send somebody else. Wow. But I got my man, Eddie. Eddie's from Veracruz, Mexico. 
we know Eddie's good. <laughs> you know, we know he's got the hands and the making of skill. Yeah. You know, because that's what we lost a lot in our culture right now is the real makers. Mm -hmm. And yet, I mean, we're so sadly short-sighted mm. in this battle at the border, if you want to call it. Yeah. Oh, it's tragic. It's totally tragic. Yeah. So here I've got Eddie and I've got Paul. I can show you the pictures on my phone here after we're done with uh -huh. this, right? And they met me out at the job site. And oh, the, the contractor, you know, was the, this young new estimator, he had the good foresight to, to bring me Paul and Eddie, right? And I worked, we made a 32 foot, four foot by eight foot sample of our wall. Mm. It took us all, the three of us, I mean, I got it going, laid some things out dry, and they started doing it. Yeah. It took about two hours, done. Suddenly the estimate makes more sense because they realize, oh, you don't want that. Geez, you really done this before. You really thought about this. And they were just really, really happy. So by the next day we had it tilted up and it's photographed and we're gonna <laughs> use that as part of the rendering technique because we'll have the real samples to photograph and it'll be in different sunlight and things like that. Wow. And that'll be part of the, the whole thing. That's and uh, so it's about that sort of connectivity to reality. And again, you're gonna have a lot of work. Mm -hmm. This is this won't come up live for a little bit because mm -hmm. I'm gonna make I'm gonna challenge you to make this your little yes. your, 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 your sound bite here. Mm -hmm. but, but that's sort of where it's about.